Welcome to today's program. My guest is Mitch from Northern Ireland, former firefighter, now evangelist. Mitch, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. I've watched the program in the past and it's such an honor and privilege to be here today. Well, we're thrilled you're on. Mitch, you grew up in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Where was that? I grew up in Belfast, in East Belfast, just at the top. Uh, my dad actually was from Cavan in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, my grandmother was from Meath in the Republic of Ireland. But uh, when my dad was young, his dad died and they sold the farm. They moved up to, to Belfast and uh, and they settled there and then uh, the family came along. So I actually live in the same house from I was four years of age. Wow. So in the, in the same neighborhood. Now you grew up with the troubles. <laughs> I, I mean, the troubles have been going on for years and years, but what was it like for you growing up yeah. amidst all of that? Yeah, well, so I mean, the troubles uh, really started officially, I guess, 68, 69. I was born in 1973, which is really the height of the Troubles. I think that year, about 300 people lost their lives. So over the whole period of the Troubles, I mean, people forget it was over 3,500 people died. And half of them were civilians who, who weren't involved, you know, either in a paramilitary activity or were involved in, the, you know, the police or the armed forces. So it was a difficult time. And, and Northern Ireland back then was very divided, very divided in the sense that the neighborhood that I grew up in was a predominantly Protestant neighborhood. Uh, you, you know, everything was red, white, and blue. The teams that you supported, uh, the school that you went to was an all Protestant school. Uh, you went to church, and we grew up in a Presbyterian church because, well, that gives you your identity. So people went to church not because, not so much because they had a deep faith, but because it gave them their identity. When you were 13, Mitch, your father passed away. How did that affect you and the family? Yeah, well, you know, mom, mom was left with, uh, with three teenage boys. I mean, I, I think when you have a trauma like that, you always have a, a, a scar from it. And, and you walk through that. And, and at 13, you know, my older brothers, teenagers, I'd seen my dad not just be a dad to them, but become a friend. Uh, and I was looking forward to those teenage years with dad. And just before Christmas, he was fairly fit. Uh, he, he actually broke his toe. He went to get it checked out and they discovered he had uh, cancer of the bone marrow. And that Christmas was just felt a bit strange, but we all thought that was going to be good. Um, and then in January, I remember being in school, double period of maths, you know, and uh, you, could, you could pick any excuse to get out of that, except, except this one, you know, when the principal comes in and says, says your, your dad's not good. And, um, we went to the hospital and, and then I went home and I remember the house full of relatives and, you know, I was religious then, so I had an idea of God, but I didn't understand. It was almost like this sort of border economy you had with God where if, if we go to church on a Sunday and teach the kids the Lord's Prayer, then you kind of leave us alone the rest of the week. So I remember going down to the, the bottom of the kitchen and we had a little dartboard and I struck a day with God. If I hit the bullseye, you let my dad live. And uh, I threw darts that my arm was sore and I never hit the bullseye, you know. And then six o'clock in the morning, you know, my older brother, you know, wakes me up, tell me my dad's dead. And uh, they were tough, tough days. Um, and I guess into my teenage years, I checked out of church. I was, you know, rebellious. And I remember, you know, my older brother used, used to say, you've got a chip on your shoulder, you know, and I would rage with anger, you know. I, but I did have a chip on my shoulder, you know. I wanted to say to him, you know, I miss my dad. I, I miss the feeling of a stubble on my cheek. I, I miss the laughs. I miss the, I, I maybe, you know, I miss the bullseye. Maybe it was my fault, you know, and that was, that was what religion did for me, you know. And uh, so it was a tough time, it, but it wasn't tough for dad. It, it, his death wasn't long and drawn out, but it was, it was tough for us as a family. As a family. Yeah. So um, you mentioned faith, but when, when did faith become a reality for you? So my bro, my, the middle brother, um, so I was a baby, um, so, the middle brother, he was a Christian, and uh, I respected that. And he went, he played professional football, and he, he actually played in, in Ipswich for, for a period of time. 
and he came back and he was given his testimony. And at the same time, I had a friend who became a Christian and they had invited me to church. So I went to their church. I didn't really enjoy it, but I was searching. I say to people, I wasn't, I wasn't miserable. I was very happy. As a non-Christian, I was very happy, but I wasn't complete. There was, there was something missing. And I, I remember meeting with those young people and sensing they had something I didn't have. Went to this service where my brother was giving his testimony. An evangelist called Roger Carswell was speaking. And that night, I think more through the testimony than anything, it just, it just connected, it made sense. Um, and so I took a little booklet called The Journey Into Life by Norman Warren. And in the quietness of my own bedroom, 19 years of age, I, uh, I prayed a prayer, invited Jesus to come into my life. Uh, the next day, I plucked up the courage to tell someone. And then the next day, someone else. And well, yeah, 30 years later, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, oh, that reminded me, um, I was given the same booklet, actually, Mitch, by our mutual friend, Andy Konomides. And on the 9th of February, 1975, I read the booklet. Wow. And uh, it has that picture of Revelation 3.20, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. That's right. Yeah, and I, too, opened that door. And it's as simple as that. But it obviously transformed you. It did. I mean, it, it, I would say, you know, and that night when I prayed the prayer, it wasn't like all of a sudden, you know, lights came on and the angels started to sing. I, I, you know, the Bible says this. It says, if you believe in your heart, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, then you shall be saved. And I, that night, you know, I believed, but there was something happens in the next couple of days when you tell someone, it almost feels like you, you put the jacket on, you, you belong to something. And that was the, the kind of crossover moment for me. And then about six weeks after uh, becoming a Christian, I was asked to give my story, my testimony in a youth fellowship. And before, like I, I wasn't well educated. I was unemployed at the time. I wasn't well educated through school. Um, the thought of standing up in front of someone, you know, and, and sharing or reading something would, would have been terrifying. But I found a, a God confidence, you know, that I wasn't doing this on my own. Um, and so that's where really the transformation in my life has been living it out. And and I, you remember, you know, John here in your story where. You know, when you asked Andy Economides, what do I do now as a Christian? And he said, well, come to Wednesday night Bible study. Yes. Go to the streets on a Saturday. Go to church on a Sunday. Yes. And I think when you set out where you are actively involved in evangelism on the street, sharing your story, when you're in a small group, home group, and when you're at church, that they are the building blocks of being a, a disciple and a, an effective disciple. Absolutely. Now, you ended up becoming a firefighter. What led you into that? Well, if truth be told, you know, when I was younger, I didn't have a dream of being a firefighter. Um, I was unemployed. I remember, like, I just felt like if I'm a Christian, I should work. I shouldn't be unemployed. I should, I should work. So I got myself a part-time job. Then I got another job. Then I got another part-time job. I was working maybe like 50 something hours a week. And I remember just praying, Lord, I really like a job where I can serve you as well and not be as busy. And then uh, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service were advertising. And uh, I knew a guy who was in the job and, and the, the, the shift pattern was really nice, four days on, four days off. I thought, gosh, I could do that and really serve the Lord. So, so I prayed about it, applied. There were like four and a half thousand people applied. They, they only accepted uh, 21 in the art group. Six of them had family in the job. Nine of them were part-time and then just guys like me. So so I got in. I, I, uh, I served for 16 years. I had a great time. Loved that job. Some good people. Learned lots of life lessons lessons through the, the, the tragedies and, uh, and the joys, you know, of, of being in the, I guess, the search and rescue business. Um, and then moved on from that in the ministry. Uh, as you said, tragedies and joys. Uh, do you have a memorable memory of a joy? Oh, well, I remember one night we got a fire call at uh, the bottom of uh, the Legany Road and we pulled up in the fire engine and there was three little children, just their heads out the sash window with black, black smoke, thick black smoke and these three little heads. And uh, I remember like, the team was so quick in putting the ladder up and I wasn't long in, you know, and. We put the ladder up and, and uh, Fergal went, 
I mean, I don't even think the ladder hit the window ledge and Fargo was already up the ladder. And he just lifted, he was a big, strong guy, just lifting those kids. And then I was at the foot of the ladder. And then when it was covered, I ran in with the station officer and we found the dad unconscious downstairs. And we got him out, the mom got out the back. So, you know, inside, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, a whole, a whole family was, was rescued. But five minutes later, the story would have been so much different, you know. So those are the moments you step back and, and all your training just, just kicks into place. You know, you, you know exactly what you got to do in that time. So they, they, were, they were precious times to celebrate. You know? Absolutely. How, how did you cope uh, as a Christian when you face tragedy in your work? Well, that, that became a great strength for me, but it also became a, a great strength for others uh, at times where, um, where non-Christians on the watch would have probed me about my faith and how I cope with that. There was one particular road traffic accident where two teenagers uh, lost their lives, and it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty bad. And uh, everybody was traumatized by that. And one particular guy who happened to be an officer was a Christian. He spoke to me afterwards and said, I, I, I just need to speak to you more about your faith. So, um, so Paul was his name, and we had a conversation. And then when my book came out, I included that story in my book. So he read the book. And then I was doing uh, some uh, messages at his church, at a cafe church. When I say his church, it was his mom's church. And he started coming to the cafe church. And then he went to Alpha. And then he came to Faith through Alpha. And so today he's actually leading worship in his church and he runs the cafe church. So out of the tragedy of that road traffic accident, and we see this through scripture and through people's lives, even in the brokenness, you know, God wastes nothing. All the broken pieces, he uses them for his glory. So that, that was a really nice story of how he came to faith and still growing in his faith today. Absolutely. And, the, and obviously they all knew that you were a Christian. Yeah, yeah, they did. And, and made the kind of the distinction between religious and Christian. Well, I hope so. <laughs> yes. That, that was always the hope. You were trying to live it out. And there was, we, we had an organization in the fire service called Firefighters for Christ. And we would have gathered monthly for breakfast um, and that was another space where people could, you know, put prayer requests in. Um, and I, I, even at far calls, I remember one particular far call, a, a gentleman, elderly gentleman shuffled into where our, our far boots were all gathered in a circle and he started to give out tracts. And uh, he said, is anyone a Christian here? And I said, well, I am, what's this? And he started to tell a story. He couldn't read or write. And his, his wife typed his tracts out and every sun, Saturday he went out with his bus pass into different neighborhoods and and gave a story out and I asked him did it work and he told me the story of it. He went to Scotland one time to Glasgow and he went into a pub and he, it was raining and he'd give out his tracks and he was chased out because the, the landlord wouldn't let him do that. And, and four weeks later, true story, he was on the main street, Royal Avenue in Belfast and this man walked up to him and said, uh, you wouldn't know me but I was in a pub in Scotland and you give out your story and I give you a little bit of stick but I put it in my pocket and I read it, and a couple of weeks ago I became a Christian, and all I knew was your name was Billy, and you were from Belfast, and I got an easy jet flight, hoping to find you, and here you are. There's a man I couldn't read or write, so when it comes to all of us and evangelism, I mean, just make yourself available. So things were come out of the fire brigade stories and great witness to the guys, you know. Absolutely. Your book, Snatched from the Fire, Great title, absolutely great. And of course, what what do you mean by that? Well, obviously it comes from that scripture in Jude, you know, where snatch others from the fire and save them. And that's what Christ done for me. Uh, and obviously it's a little play on the words of this, the sense that I was a firefighter. And I was in the fire service when I wrote that book. And my, my heart's desire at the time was to, to write a book that, that men could pick up and read easily. And that's that men generally are generally aren't good readers. So I wanted short uh, chapters that would be catchy, some humor, nostalgia, sort of thought provoking chat. And it's to this day, you know, I, I did an outreach last week in Portadown and there was one lady came to me and said, you know, her husband's not a Christian, but she got a copy of my book. She took it home. He read the whole book in four hours in the Saturday afternoon. So it is the kind of book that where men can pick it up and read it easily. And it's, it's my story, but it's not just my story. It's God's story mixed in with that, you know, so uh, hopefully, you know, it's of use for some people. 
But, but obviously, you having been a fireman for 16 years, snatched from the fire, it, it, it means a lot more, doesn't it? Oh, it does, for sure. I mean, for it's, sure. It's about having that personal relationship with Jesus is the most important thing. You know, anybody who's watching, and maybe you're religious, or maybe you're a skeptic, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian 30 years. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And, and he gave me that missing piece right from the start. But he gave me much more than that. Uh, I don't know how people live in the world today with so much uncertainty, not knowing what truth is, struggling for meaning, morality, you know, destiny, origin. You know, Jesus gives us all of that. He gives us an abundance of that. And he promised that. I'd give you a rich and satisfying life, John 10, 10. And uh, he's done that for me. And I, my life's not perfect, but uh, it's much, much more complete with Jesus in it. What would you say, uh, Mitch, to any of our listeners, viewers, what would you say to them if they haven't yet made that decision? Well, you know, I, I've been involved in evangelism really from, from my, I started as a Christian. I, I, I work in a ministry called Crown Jesus. And in our ministry, we try to commit the good, communicate the good news to all kinds of people because it is for everyone, that no one will be left out. So in our team, we've, we work with children, we work with young people, we work with addicts, we work with elderly. We're trying to reach all kinds of people because when, when God declared that he loved the world, uh, he didn't mean just a little bit. He, he means everybody, and that includes people, people like you. And no matter what journey you've been on in life, whether you're from another faith or no faith, whether you're coming to this as an atheist and a skeptic, uh, God's love doesn't go up and down like an elevator. For God so loved the whole world that he gave. And, and that verse in the King James is, is 25 words long, and the center word is son, it's Jesus. The first part is what God has done for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And the second part is what we must do, that whosoever believes, that Greek word there, pistou, it means to put your trust in. Not just a, you know, a, a fluffy belief, but to put your trust, to put your hope in. So for God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus, that whosoever believes in him and puts their trust in him will have everlasting life. But you know, I heard, I think it was Steve Gook Roger many years ago said, Christianity isn't just a pie in the sky when you die. It's a stake on the plate while you wait. And it's a Christ-filled life for now. And, and I would encourage you uh, just to reach out. He's one prayer away. He's just one prayer away. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy words. It's just one prayer. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. You died for me. You rose again on the third day. Would you come into my life and help me start this journey? And I will be more than happy, and, and Philo, Cam and J. John will be more than happy to help you get the right resources and put you on the right path as you start as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. It's the best life. If anyone wants to open that door, Mitch, now, would you lead them in a prayer? I'd love to. Uh, Father God, Father God, thank you for not giving up on us. We're truly sorry for the wrong things that we have done. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus who died on a cross to take the punishment that we deserve. Father, thank you that your son rose again on the third day. You said in your word, if I confess with my lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that he rose from the dead, I shall be saved. And so according to your word, I put my trust in you. Like a little child, I simply pray Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And one day give me a home in your kingdom where I can praise you forevermore. Amen. 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 And if you echoed that prayer, uh, we pray that you will know his peace and his presence and know his protection. And can we encourage you, especially today, to read the Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and just listen, read the words of Jesus and allow him to guide you in your faith. Mitch, you spent 16 years in the fire service and then you felt the call uh, to do the work of an evangelist, which you were already doing anyway. But tell us about that transition and what led you to become a full-time evangelist. Well, uh, as a young Christian, I'm thankful that I had um, 
a good Pentecostal friends that signposted me towards evangelists. Um, Reinhard Bunke from Germany, uh, Steve Hill, and others. Um, and so I started to watch uh, the, their programs. A friend of mine had God TV, so I used to record it on videotapes. I used to watch that, so I was influenced by you know, what an evangelist was. And then uh, really felt that God was tugging my heart and my two friends as well for evangelism in Ireland. Um, and we went to Germany to a fire conference by, by Steve. Steve Hill was speaking there. It was Reinhard Bunke's fire conference. And on Pentecost Sunday, 1999, he laid hands on us and uh, commissioned us to Ireland. And I cried like a baby at the back of, uh, back of that hall. I knew my life would never be the same. And so we started Crying Jesus Ministries, small big beginnings, just trying to, to figure that out. And we're thankful that we've had good counsel, people like yourself have invested into us, supported us, to give us wisdom. Uh, and so we started small. And today we're, we're 16, 17 staff. Um, and we would be in primary schools, secondary schools, uh, working with about 100 churches every year uh, in both the north and south of Ireland. So next weekend I'll be in Ross Common, I'll be in County Offaly, I'll be in County Limerick over the three days. So we have a heart for the whole island and to see people coming into a relationship with Jesus. So we work as a team. I believe that evangelism works best in the context of team and also working with churches. That we, we equip the church, we serve the church, we build up disciples and, and not just converts. So we have a good team. We're, we're very thankful for that the Lord has had us, his hand upon us. You know. What's the situation like in Ireland, north and south? Well, yeah, well, it, it, the, the challenge is great. So if you take, from my studies, the Republic of Ireland would continue to be the most unevangelized English-speaking nation in the world. So most unevangelized English-speaking nation. And what in the do you world. mean by that? Pro, well, about three percent evangelical. And to contrast that, you know, Northern Ireland, you know, arguably has more churches per square foot than any other English-speaking nation in the world. So you begin to wonder, you know, the, the troubles of the, the past 30 plus years, how much of that has actually been spiritual battle. But we, we see now more and more of those doors of opportunity in the Republic of Ireland have opened up. And it's not a matter of just people from the North going to the Republic. That's a really terrible sort of concept. The, the idea is to, to work with life-giving, healthy churches in the Republic. Uh, CCI, which is part of AOG, are growing very well. The Baptist Church is doing very well. But the need is great. So if you take like Offaly, so Offaly is a county right in the heart of, of Ireland. Offaly, about 80,000 people, it's got six evangelical churches. So from us working with them, there's about 300 people who attend those churches. But let's say there's another 200 who attend churches outside of Offaly. Well, if it's 500, you're still talking about Offaly being 0.5% evangelical. The Islamic Republic of Pakistan is 1.27% Christian. Cuba is 5% Christian. So, so, and this is right on our doorstep. You know, Offaly is it's a three and a half hour drive from, from Belfast. So the need is great. But we're thankful that we've got great ministry partners. Uh, John Edwards uh, works with is a dear friend. He was uh, originally from Dublin. And then we work with uh, a lot of churches down there. This week I'm working with uh, three different denominations. I'll be with a Baptist church. I'll be with a Pentecostal church. And I'll be with one that's called Cornerstone. Um, so we're thankful for the doors that are opening. But the need is great. And the more support that we have, the better. So as you look at the future, Mitch, what, what is your hope? What do you dream as you think of Ireland, both north and south? What, well, you know, as a ministry, Crown Jesus Ministries has a vision. And you, all, you should always, as a ministry, have a, or a church, have a vision that you can't do without God. So ours is that the people of Ireland will crown Jesus Lord of their lives, that everybody in Ireland will become a Christian. Now, so, you, so when you say crown Jesus, how do you unpack that for us? Yeah, so that, that is just making him Lord of your life, to actually make him the centerpiece, to, to, to you know, enthrone him as the Lord of your life. So, not so how do we make him the Lord of our lives? So we, we do that when we, first of all, we recognize that, that we can't be the center of our lives, that, that we're wired in a way, that we're broken. All of humanity, the whole earth is filled with thorns and thistles from the fall, and we're all broken. And so 
And it's a great question because sometimes people look back at, at the cross and say, how does that make sense? Something that happened 2,000 years ago, how does that make sense to me today? So what we need to see is that all of humanity is broken and that God in his great love, there's a great picture in Romans, there's probably eight metaphors in the New Testament of what Christ's coming meant. But one great metaphor is of God the just judge and paying the ransom that we might go free. So whenever we're inviting Jesus to be the Lord, crowning him as King and Lord of our lives, what we're saying is that we're stepping off the, the throne and we're putting Jesus on it. We're stepping off and saying, I keep, I keep doing the wrong thing. And so I need someone to help me like be a compass in my life. Not that I'm gonna be perfect, but that I'm gonna to strive towards what it means to be tov, good, to follow the good shepherd who laid down, down his life for his people. And, and you know, back to Ireland, again, 32 counties, we had that dream, but tactically, we're working on a plan to, by the end of this decade, uh, we choose to go into all 32 counties of Ireland that everybody will have an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. So by the end of the decade, we'll make sure that two and a half million homes in Ireland have all got a booklet that all 930 schools have been, secondary schools have been visited. So we've got like a, a five pronged strategy and um, you, we really value your prayers. If you're a Christian watching to, to pray for us as we play this out. And it's not just a crying Jesus thing, it's working with our other ministry partners and churches because uh, you use a phrase that you often use, uh, Jay John, you haven't got it all together, but together we've got it. Um, Absolutely. And we need the team, the whole body of Christ uh, working together for the kingdom of God. Absolutely. Well done for all that you and your team are doing at Crown Jesus Ministries. And uh, let's pray that the Lord will continue to use you all and see that happening in Ireland. Thank you for joining us Thank you. on Facing the Canon. Thank you. I really hope that you've uh, enjoyed that story and a bit of Mitch's story. We're trying to tell stories about what God is doing in people's lives uh, and in the countries that they live in. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again.